The nature of freedom is like breathing. 20,000 times a day, roughly, we breathe. How many do we notice? You don't notice freedom until it's taken away from you. And that moment when it's going to be taken away, you fight for it with every fiber of your being. We're here, we've met in the name of freedom. It's the thing that unifies us in this room. Norway is representative in so many countries around the world in the name of freedom. But we're also divided by freedom because it is an individual thing. And for each one of us in this room, our sense of freedom has been boxed in by a date. And through the last two days, we've heard the dates that are that marking point for people here. Each of those dates has an enormous individual significance. It may not be shared by others, but it defines that moment when we decided to fight for our life, for our freedom. In the case of Kashmir, the state that is divided between Pakistan and India, while the world was focusing on what was happening in Berlin, Kashmir's war began. Kashmir's now had a conflict for 22 years. And we don't hear very much about it. Its roots go back to 1947, to when the randomness of the post-colonial era, era meant that roots were put down that remain unresolved. But I'm not here to talk about the political history of that, because so many libraries have been filled with it. And I've come to talk to you about the other freedom, the internal freedom, the one that very often isn't brought to the table. And every conflict that we've heard about, every situation that we've been told about, has its own pathology. And when scientific words, medical words, are used to describe conflict, very often it becomes confusing. But pathology is a deviation from the healthy state. Conflict is a deviation from the healthy state. So Kashmir's pathology is that a people have been living with a conflict that is very unreported. As one of the doctors who works with our mental health project said, and this is just his perception, when a rat dies in Gaza, it's on the front page of the New York Times, how many of our people are shot in cold blood during a curfew on the streets for it even to get a column inch on the back page? That is his perception. That is Kashmiri's perception of how their conflict is perceived. 22 years crosses three generations. And I just want to take you into, well, <laughs> the Kashmiri mindset. As so many, again, of the patients and the doctors working with us say, every time we see one of these sets up, setups, which any of you who've been to South Asia will be very familiar with, the crossing of wires, they say, this is what's happened to us. We've all gone mad. So, I'll tell you about Amina. Amina has been coming to our project for a few years now, and when she tells us her story, she each time repeats parts of the same story, and she sits and she rocks. And the genius of Amina's fragmented mind is that it's allowing her to comfort herself, even as she's telling the story that has fragmented her mind. About eight years ago, Amina, like many other Kashmiris, was trying to just go on with her daily life. And as happens often on Friday afternoons, there's the Friday market after Friday prayers. In Srinagar, the summer capital of Kashmir, this place of lakes and mountains, the old mosque, the central mosque, the Jamia Masjid, is a beautiful wooden building, which is very untypical of many mosques. It's in the, in the Central Asian theme. And all around it, on Friday afternoons, is the bustle of the market. Ever since she'd first got married, Amina had been going to the market on Friday afternoons, because in a place of lakes, it makes sense to eat fish after prayers when there's some sense of celebration. And she'd gone to the same fish seller every Friday of the Fridays that she went. And they would exchange niceties. Just, you know, how are your children? Telling tales of their children, how are your children? And so it would go in that familiar pattern that makes up the quotidian round. 
And one Friday when Amina went to the market, she'd bought her fish, they'd exchanged their news with each other. She turned to walk away, and she turned around a wall beside the market, so she was protected by, from the grenade blast that followed. She turned back to see, as she described it, exploding fish, and as she said to me, exploding fish seller. Now, as Amina's story went on, she then told us quite a few visits later about the death of her son in Crossfire a couple of years after this incident. Her family chose not to tell her about it until several days afterwards. They actually held the funeral without her knowing. She never saw her son's body, and as is the tradition in Islam, she didn't attend the funeral, obviously. Amina's world had fragmented because she'd conflated these two things, so that to start with, when she tried to go to the market, every time she had a graphic replay of these two things, she would see her son's body amongst exploding fish in graphic detail around her. And then that began to spread from just when she was trying to get to the market to when she was trying to sleep at night. And she would lie there rigidly with her heart palpitating, as she said, exploding out of her chest so that she couldn't sleep. And it got to the stage with Amina where she was no longer able to function. She, as she said, and this for a Kashmiri uh, Muslim woman to say this, I no longer care about my children. I've lost my son. I don't care about my other children. I don't care about my husband. I don't care about my home. She couldn't remember how to cook any of the things that she'd been cooking all her life. Amina's mind had fragmented. Amina's mind had had an overload. That's the case of uh, your average, let us say, housewife in Kashmir. She represents the middle generation. This is not Amina, but it could just as well be Amina. The older generation, who remember the Kashmir before 1989, this place of poetic beauty, where the Himalayas are right there, behind the lakes, where the poplar trees fringe the lakes. This place that in everyone's imagination is loved and adored. They remember it and they mourn the Kashmir that has been lost. Amina's generation have been trying to find a way to deal with this. The younger generation, the younger generation have grown up knowing only conflict. And as happens when you grow up, only knowing a round of daily violence, when you're on your way to school and you have to go through check posts and you have a gun to your head, and this becomes the daily norm, except it's not normal at all, two things can happen. Either you can become psychotic or you're fearless. And if you are fearless, then you will pick up a stone or a Molotov cocktail or whatever you can lay your hand on, and you will throw it with the full force of your being against men carrying guns or men in tanks. The people of Kashmir regard themselves as victims, as so many of the groups, the regions that we've been talking about over the last few days. And victimhood has its own pathology, because when people very understandably become collectively victims of violence, they lose their ability to be able to discern. They lose their ability to be able to take daily responsibility for themselves, either through total mental breakdown, as happened with Amina, or because if you are a victim, nothing is your fault anymore. The young people that we're able to work with, the young Kashmiris who have joined our mental health project, are the core of what we see as a way of moving forward. The thing that is not brought to the table is, how can you build a leadership out of a people who cannot sleep at night, who cannot wake up in the morning because they haven't slept at night, if they've managed just to fall into the edge of sleep in the dawn? How can you build a leadership from young people who can only think of taking to the streets to throw stones, whose daily round is trying to work out how they're going to fill their day? They don't have any sense of how they'll be able to get a job, how they'll be able to provide for a family in the future. They don't have any sense of a future. Part of the nature of victimhood is the loss of hope. So when you have a society, as one of the 
psychiatrists we were working with said 90% of the population of Kashmir has been psychologically damaged as a result of this ongoing conflict. When you have a people who are this damaged, who are this unable to make even the most basic decision, unless this is addressed, unless, as these young people we're working with, are able to learn to analyze themselves and to see how they have been impacted by growing up in a society where violence is a daily reality. It's not even post-traumatic stress disorder because it's still ongoing. When they understand honestly how that has impacted them, when they understand how to read their behavior, when they understand how they make their decisions out of that behavior pattern, out of the behavior pattern of them as an individual, as a family, as a collective society, they begin to be able to read their situation. And once they have even the smallest ability to self-analyze and to take responsibility for their actions, then they become a young society that is able to discern the way to move forward into the medium term, into the long term. Kashmir is, blanketly, is blanket medicated. Many people wander around in a semi-zombie state. Our project is trying to train young Kashmiris to use their experience and their understanding of growing up to help those around them who are more fundamentally damaged than they are. This is the way that we see it working. This is the way it is working. So the Oslo Freedom Forum provides a theater, a place to be able to come together. I've been listening, we've all been listening to people who are, in a way, we're single voices, we stand alone on this stage. When you are out there, when people are out there, your voice feels very small and you feel great despair at times. To me, the gift of being able to come somewhere like this is to be able to say, unless we bring the psychological damage of not just Kashmir, but any conflict onto the table, how on earth can you build a leadership from within that will be sustainable, that will last into the future, if stuff is endlessly being templated from the outside without looking at the clay you're actually working with? Not trying to turn it into something it's not, but working with the clay that is available, that will provide something sustainable, a people who can take responsibility for how they choose to build their future and can take those decisions from a place of rational balance. This is why the mental health pro question, apparently the unsexiest question in the world, I keep being told, the mental health question, how can it be left off the table? Every one of us in this room knows how we feel when we have to deal with anxiety. So take our own experience, magnify it, not in some people's case by very much, but for some of us by millions, and then ask, how would we be doing in Tunisia? How would we be doing in Srinagar? How would we be doing in Darfur? And when we can answer that question effectively, we will understand how vital it is to bring mental health, mental instability, the psychological damage of war to the table. Oslo Freedom Forum, I thank you for bringing sometimes the single voices of despair together to become one really single powerful voice. It's a real honor to be here, and thank you for listening.